I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to this episode, number 38 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now, you can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 038. Now, the gun of the show on this episode, which should be coming up on the YouTube screen, if you're looking at this on YouTube, it should be coming up right about now, is the Ruger Standard. Now, this is the gun that started it all for Sturm Ruger. For those of you who don't know, when you buy a new modern Sturm Sturm Ruger pistol, like in, I don't know, SR-1911, that's a good one, or an SR-9, or an SR-40, or an SR-45, Everybody refers to it as a Ruger SR-45 or a Ruger SR-1911. The SR stands for Sturm Ruger, which is actually the name of the company. Well, I want to say it... mm, Give me a moment here. I got to think about it. I want to say it was around 1949 the first uh, Ruger standards came out. And they were good. They were good guns. People snapped them up. A lot of people like to call them Lugers because... There is a vague resemblance to them, even though the guns are actually based on a Japanese Nambu design. However, the Ruger Standard is a rimfire pistol, and I I happen to have one. I paid $100 for it five years ago or so. The guy I bought it from didn't want to go through the trouble of cleaning it, and the guy he bought it from couldn't get it to work right. Well, I took the gun apart, gave it a real good cleaning, and it's been since I got actually since I actually got it cleaned. It's been a real reliable rimfire. Not as reliable as my uh, as my other little Ruger rimfire that I've talked about on here, but it's plenty reliable. Now, for those that don't know, I I am kind of a fan of Ruger pistols, and uh, I'll be honest, I like Rugers. They have some good quality firearms. Some people will tell you that Rugers are junk. Some or some folks will say Rugers are junk. So I'm, I apologize. I'm getting a little too far away from the microphone. I'm trying not to breathe into it too bad. I've got a, I've got the heat off in this room because the heater is making a noise and it's got to be looked at. But uh, it's making a noise. It's got a bearing going out, and well, if it was running, you would not hear it. So I'm trying to keep you from hearing me shivering over the while I'm doing this in the cold because the temperature is in. Eh, well, it's right here on my desktop screen. Temperature is in the 40s. And I'm a West Texas boy. I don't I don't do cold very well. However, Sturm, uh, Sturm Ruger built this pistol. And, you know, it was a good gun. For the time, it was kind of revolutionary. It basically served to start the company. It was a, it was actually a brilliant way to start the company, kind of like Smith and Wesson. You know, uh, Sturm Ruger got their start basically as a. Uh, Rimfire manufacturer or rimfire gun manufacturer. You know, a few things you'll be interested in on this particular Ruger standard. A lot of people will call it a Mark I, but it's not. The Mark I is actually the target version of this gun. The Mark II was both the target and non target version, and just like the Mark III is also the target and non target version. However, prior to the Mark II, the Mark I was only used to, re- to uh, identify the target version, while the standard designation was used as the name and the product model for the base model. Now, this particular gun is a mid-60s vintage. That means if you remove the magazine, which I am doing right now, the follower, if you if you got the magazine so that you're looking at the back of it, the follower is on the right side of the magazine. I want to say it wasn't much later than when this gun was made. I want to say... Five, six years after this one was made, Ruger changed the frame a little bit. This was because the tooling used to make this particular gun wore out. And because they were planning to make some changes with the Mark II that was going to be coming out in about a decade or so, they moved the button from the right side to the left side. Now, the button I'm referring to is what retains the follower in the magazine. So, basically, you can take the magazine apart and, well... The button keeps it from over-traveling. The original Ruger standard, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say the original magazines, actually, when the, you inserted them and you fired the gun, the magazine would actually stop the bolt. Not by a, uh, not by a little bolt stop lever, but by the, <laughs> by the follower actually getting caught by the bolt. Well, that was not really the best way to do it. That kind of damaged the bolt on a few guns, but it, 
you know, it was designed for that, so it really didn't hurt it too bad. However, the Ruger standard that I have, like I said, I was probably the first person in 30 or 40 years, or I haven't said this, but I will. I was probably the first person in 30 or 40 years to take the gun apart and clean it. Because like every other Ruger that people have seen, the Mark IIs and the Mark Threes, it is a pain to get this gun apart and back together. Well, I'm going to say that if you ever have a chance to pick up one of the three A100 Ruger standards or Ruger uh, Mark Ones, do it. You, you will probably have to take it apart, give it a good cleaning. I recommend a Sonic Cleaner. It helps a lot when removing decades of grime. And I won't lie to you, when I took the gun apart, when I first removed the bolt, I, I was kind of impressed by how well the bluing on the bolt had held up. Unfortunately, it hadn't. What I thought was the bluing on the bolt was actually a residue. Well, when I was given the gun a cleaning, I discovered that there was literally a wall of residue all around bolt chamber. It kind of impressed me. I love this gun because, well, I've always liked the design of the Ruger Standard. But you know, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of too attached to this gun to really talk about it objectively. And a lot of people have shot this gun before I ever got it. But let me say that, in in my opinion, this is one of my favorite. And you gotta understand, I have a lot of favorite guns. But if I had to pare it down to one rimfire pistol, is all I could keep, and I had to either give away or sell all the others, this would probably be the rimfire I keep. Okay. You know what? I've gone through enough enough talk about an old wore out Ruger rimfire pistol. Let me just say that if you do have a Ruger Standard or a Ruger Mark One with like this one that uses the uh, magazines with the button on the right side, don't despair. You can buy the Mark One or Mark Two magazines that have the button on the left side, and all you have to do to make them usable is switch the button to the other side. Kind of a neat thing. However, I think it's time to move the show on because. This gun of the show was kind of unplanned. It's been busy for me at work, uh, holidays and all. With that said, I want to run the promo that tells you how to, not promo, the little audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And keep in mind that the show is available on YouTube. So please go download the show on YouTube or not download it, but watch it on YouTube or download it here or get it somehow and enjoy the show. Now then, let's get the show out there or let's tell you how to get the show in all the other ways. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website gunrightsintexas.com. Alright, if I have time, I may do a little bit more experimenting with the YouTube video. This all depends on my work schedule for the next few days. I'm recording this late Friday evening. By late Friday evening, I mean Friday night. And I'll probably just go straight to bed after I get done recording it. And Saturday morning, I'll work on uh, post-production and getting it ready to be uploaded. However, uh, this is the last episode I'm going to get out before Christmas. And there may be... Let me look at the calendar. I don't have my calendar in here anymore. I've been cleaning and reorganizing the reloading room, which is also serving as a studio. However, I've got this episode, and then I got one right after Christmas, and that'll be the last two episodes we have before January of 2015. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, 2015 is a very promising year. This show started out as the Open Carry Report. We rebranded to get away from all the negativity of anything associated with open carry and Texas, mostly because of a few groups that tend to be, they tend to take a more in-your-face approach. And while that, while that does get stuff done in some circles, it really doesn't help gun rights. But we're not here to talk about that. We're not here to talk about them. So let's talk about the Christmas holiday. You know, it's been co-opted com by commercial interest. But in the end, anybody that's a Christian knows what it's really about. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further, and I'm going to ask that in the spirit of the Christmas holiday, keep in mind that your fellow man needs the gift. They need the gift of understanding. So please 
when you're out there, you're trying to make uh, you're trying to make ends meet, or you're trying to get people to understand what's going on with gun rights. Do so in a light, in a professional, or how about we just settle for even a courteous manner? Don't go throwing stuff in people's faces. You know, well, here's the thing. Christ didn't go out there and he didn't, he didn't do in your face things to get attention. When he did something that was more of an in your face type event at the time, it was a very calculated thing. And you really have to understand that where we're coming from now, we, we really have to work on that. Later in the show, I want to in the news segment, I'm going to talk about the last three. Sh- oh man, I just uh, lost my thought. Oh, I remember what it was. Now I lost my thought and I regained it. In the last three sessions of the Texas Legislature, we've had a legislation either drafted or in committee or just simply filed and died in committee. But we've had legislation. It's got to various points in the legislature, and well, it hasn't made it any further than that. 2015 is the year to make it happen. We have. We have a plethora of bills. We have a lot of people taking interest in it, both for and against it. And we have a governor saying, yes, we need open carry. If this notorious anti-gun state of Taxachusetts has legal open carry, why doesn't Texas? And yes, I said Taxachusetts. Um, these are valid things to consider. But keep in mind, we cannot lose. We cannot go into full derp mode and say it's this or nothing. We did not get to where we are right now with gun laws uh, overnight. The anti-gunners didn't wake up one day and say, hey, let's implement everything we know right now as gun control. No, they worked on it. They did it gradually, one piece at a time. If we go in there and we start trying to, we start trying to push, hey, let's get everything done right now and let's not wait, well, we're going to get nothing if we take the all or nothing approach. I would love to repeal every bit of the weapons laws in Texas and then turn the attention to dealing with committing the crime. You know, why why make it illegal to carry a gun when you should make it illegal to use a gun to commit a crime? And that's really what we're what we need. However, there's those out there that will go war garble. Felons need guns too, war garble. And while that may be, while that may make sense to, you know, portions of the Second Amendment crowd, it may not make sense to all of it. It may not make sense to the general public. In fact, I guarantee you it doesn't. I personally feel that if somebody has done their time, they have, uh, you know, they have met the requirements of their sentence, they should have the ability to have their rights restored. I mean, we do this for voting. Why not do it for firearms? Now, I also think that a violent felon that is a repeat offender, should, they should lose their gun rights. Not because they should be out on the streets, but because they should be in prison where they don't get a gun. If you have a problem with somebody, they go out and they commit armed robbery, they commit murder, they commit rape, you lock them up, make them serve their time. If they're not rehabilitated and you let them back out into society and they do it again, and the only way you can find out if they're actually rehabilitated is to let them back out in society. If they do that crime again, or they do another violent crime, they're not rehabilitated, and they probably cannot be rehabilitated. So you take them back into prison, and you hold them there until you're certain that they're rehabilitated again. And this time, you have a much stricter sentencing guideline. Instead of, say, he committed a crime, he committed this violent crime, and he served 10 years, he's out, and now he's committed another crime, So we're going to give him 10 years, but he's going to be eligible for parole in two. No, 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 no. You take this guy that's committed this violent crime, you lock him up for another 10 years, if that's all the law will allow. And then you work on changing the law so that you can sentence him for 20 for the second one. Now let's say he's 18 when he committed the first one. He's 28 when he committed the second because he committed it the day he got out. Well, he'll be 48 when he gets gets out of the second one. Now, he spent, almost, he spent three-fifths of his life in confinement. Why would he go out and commit another crime? If he does, give him a life sentence if he commits a violent crime a third time or even a second time. But here's the thing. We, as a society, we have decided certain people lose certain rights under certain conditions, and that is understandable. 
But we do not need to penalize the tools. We need to penalize the action. I don't think that it should be illegal for somebody to own a piece of pipe that's got some grooves inside of it that's of a specific diameter, no matter the length. Now, if that piece of pipe just happens to be part of a firearm, the length of it should not matter. I mean, I can go to Ace Hardware. I can buy a three-inch piece of PVC pipe. I can buy a 10-foot piece of PVC pipe. Actually, I don't think I can buy 10-foot. I think it's like nine is the most local place has. I don't know. I really don't mess with plumbing that much. However, I can buy PVC pipe in various lengths. I can buy steel pipe in various lengths. However, if I'm if I'm building a rifle, I should not have to build a rifle that ha- and make sure that the piece of pipe that's attached to the part that actually you know does the work, that piece of pipe has to be over a certain length without paying if I don't want to pay a tax. Well, these are all good thoughts. However, we cannot repeal all these with just state and lo- federal laws, one each. We have to go through, it took them a while to get all these implemented, and it's going to take us a while to get them all unimplemented. But eventually, we can repeal just about everything. Am I saying that I think felons should be allowed to have guns? No. But I am saying I think we should not allow felons out of prison until we can trust them with a gun. Am I saying that I think uh, short-barreled rifles and short-barreled shotguns should be legal without a tax stamp? Heck yes. Am I saying that Or am I implying that I might think that machine guns should be legal without a tax stamp? Yes. Let me just go out and say it. Yes. And I have really gone off track here. But to get back to the point, I'm not going to go out there. I'm not going to shove these views in everybody's face. I'm not going to try and tell them it's this or nothing because I'm not going to win their support doing that. Just because there are... 30 some odd thousand likes between a Facebook page and a Facebook group does not mean that a, uh, that a group is that size. No, there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of people that just like it so they can get the information in their feed. They may not like it at all, but on Facebook, they click the like button. Now then, in the, in the spirit of Christmas, go out there, evangelize, but do so in a considerate and polite manner. Don't go out there and use the in-your-face tactics. It has hurt us before. It will hurt us again. With that said, I am going to go ahead. I'm going to hit the button that's going to play the social media audio clip, and then we'll come back and we'll hit our topic. Our topic in this episode is open carry and constitutional carry myths and facts. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at GunRightsNTX. On Facebook and Google+, it is GunRightsInTexas. So please, be social. Okay, we are back and, well, let's actually talk about our topic. And, you know, there's a lot of facts, there's a lot of myths going around. And we're going to address that. You know, one of the biggest arguments against open carry that's being thrown out there is we won't know who is a criminal and who is legally carrying without stopping them. Well, let me give you a little bit of a hint here. Criminals already carry and they do it concealed. The reason they conceal their weapon is they try to avoid attention. Now, in all honesty, when you hear this argument that we won't know who is a criminal or who is legal when they're carrying, we were seeing somebody that's trying to blur the lines. And in all honesty, open carry actually makes it easier to see who is and is not armed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everybody that concealed carries is a criminal. In fact, far from it. There are probably more people legally carrying a gun concealed than there are criminals carrying a gun concealed in Texas. Is that the case in Illinois? Probably not. In Illinois, I don't think they even bother to conceal it because the cops run away on sight. You know, the cops show up, criminal says, I'm a member of such and such gang. Well, have a good day, sir. Take care. If you need backup, let us know. I mean, this is Chicago politics we're talking about in Illinois. Anyways, let's get back to the subject. The whole argument that we won't know who is a criminal or or who is illegally and legally carrying without stopping them or 
anything like that, you don't have to stop everybody that's open carrying a gun and check them to make sure they're a law-abiding citizen. In fact, that would actually be a violation of the Fourth Amendment. You know, that thing that says, well, it's a, you're protected against unreasonable searches and seizures and things like that. Well, in all honesty, at least in my opinion, you really don't run into a problem with, some, with somebody that's open carrying a gun that's a criminal. In fact, right now, a criminal can open carry a gun just like they'd be able to open carry a gun after the law would be put into effect. They would still be breaking the law. And once again, we come back to the whole concept of we are trying to ban a tool in, instead of trying to punish an action or trying to uh, prohibit an action. Now, another argument that's made against open carry is open carry might hurt reciprocity. Uh, let me think about that one for a moment. Out of 50 states, there are 44 that have open carry. And uh, let's see here. Hmm. Just thinking about it, I think most of those states that have reciprocity with us also have open carry. Why would it make a difference if we have licensed open carry to these other states? It should not hurt reciprocity. I'm sorry. In fact, it's highly doubtful it would hurt reciprocity. In fact, let me go a little bit further. If we went to a system where we have what a lot of people are referring to as constitutional carry, although I'm in the school of thought, we should refer to it as unlicensed carry. If we had unlicensed carry, somebody coming into Texas would automatically have reciprocity established for them because they would not need a license at all to carry here. We would maintain our concealed handgun license program in order to give that option to somebody that needed reciprocity. So let's say we have somebody that goes to visit in, I don't know, Florida. They have a Texas CHL. They go to Florida. They have their concealed handgun license. They go, they carry without a problem. Florida still recognizes it. No problem. Now you have a tourist from Florida coming to Texas. Now this tourist does not have, this, we'll say that our tourist does not have a Florida concealed handgun license, but this tourist is a uh, very law-abiding citizen, and they realize they're going to be in the bad part of town in whichever city they're visiting. Well, you know what? We'll go a little further. We'll even pick out a town. They're going to be in the bad part of Dallas. Now, here's our tourist. They're in the bad part of Dallas. We have constitutional carry, so they're able to be armed. They're able to defend themselves. And while they're in the bad part of town, because that's where their family lives, this uh, this gangbanger of whichever race you want to put them in. Everybody's going to pick their own race here. Your gangbanger who's wearing a ski mask, so you really can't see his uh, features to identify him. He comes up, he pulls a knife, and he says, give me all your money. Well, your Florida resident draws their weapon. Maybe they're carrying concealed. Maybe they're carrying openly because, well, we have, by some miracle, passed HB 195. And here you are with... Here you are with a non-resident carrying legally, even though he could not legally carry in his home state, he's carrying legally here. He defends himself. And let's say the hoodlums thinks, oh, he's not going to use that gun, charges at the uh, victim, the victim shoots the hoodlum, and then it's later discovered the hoodlum has killed every one of his other victims. Guess what? It doesn't matter if there was any kind of an use of deadly force. The victim goes home. And he starts thinking, hey, Texas has got better laws. They let me defend myself where I can't do it here. And then he thinks, hey, I've got this great business and it would work well in Texas. So he moves his business, his family and all that here to Texas. And now Texas has a net gain. Did it hurt reciprocity? Well, not really, but it did help the economy. You really won't see much of that, but you will see people that are more than likely going to say, hey, I have a better chance of defending myself in Texas than I do in wherever I, they live. So I think I want to move there or I think I want to move my business there. And really, the myth that OC or open carry might hurt reciprocity and the myth that we won't know who criminals are or if a criminal's carrying or if it's a legal person that's carrying. Those are really the two big arguments that are competition, and I'm using that word so that I don't have to really use what I think of them. But the anti-gun crowd 
are using those two arguments more than others. But let's have a look at uh, some facts about open carry. And this is where it gets interesting. We have 50 states in this grand union. And in our grand union, 88% of those states have some form of open carry. 88%. Think about it like this. If we had 88% of both houses in any legislature, we could get any bill we wanted passed with or without the chief executive's signature. If the chief executive of whichever government body that we're trying to get legislation through vetoes it, it comes back, we can override the veto. 88% means 44 states out of 50 have some form of open carry. Now, six of those states do not require a permit for residents to carry in any form. Yes, that's right, six states. Now, for non-residents, there are five states. Now, 30 states do not require a permit for residents to open carry. Wyoming is kind of, I I really hadn't had time to look into it, but Wyoming, it may be legal for a non-resident to carry there. If it is, then there's 30 states for non-residents to carry. If it's not legal for a non-resident to carry without a permit, then you got 29. And there is another state with a gray area in regards to carry, and that's Arkansas. You see, a lot of people will tell you Arkansas has constitutional carry. And some people will tell you, no, actually, Arkansas doesn't. And Arkansas's law is kind of a accident that happened. Essentially, they were trying to do this omnibus cleanup of their firearms laws. And, well, they included some language that everybody in the open carry movement is saying, legalized, unlicensed open carry and unlicensed concealed carry. Others say, well, and this would be others, including the state attorney general, I believe. These folks are saying, well, actually, no, you don't get uh, open carry from this law. Now, you do have 14 states that require a permit for open carry. Think about that. That's 28% of the states in the union, less than a third, require a permit for open carry. You have six states that uh, prohibit open carry for the most part. And when I say the most part, there are some exemptions in these states for certain activities. I think in California, you can legally open carry an unloaded pistol if you're in a rural environment and there's no, there's no prohibition by the county or something like that. I think Florida will allow you to have a firearm openly carried if you are hunting or fishing. Illinois, I forget about it. New York, hmm, forget about it. South Carolina, really haven't looked into it, but I suspect it's more like Florida and Texas. And here in Texas... You can legally open carry a long gun, plus you can legally open carry if you're hunting and the firearm, or if you're doing an activity and the firearm is one of a type that's used in this activity. Now then, for the record, Miss Lawson, uh, you may have heard me refer to her. She's emailed us a number of times here on the show. But Ms. Lawson refers to California, Florida, Illinois, New York, South Carolina, and Texas as the Sinister Six, the six states that prohibit open carry. I like that. I'm a comic book fan. If you don't understand the idea behind the Sinister Six, I suggest you check out uh, Marvel Comics in a little more detail. I mean, I think they make a movie or two about, you know, the comics or the Marvel Comics universe. And oddly enough, I think they may be owned by Disney of all things. Or at least now they are. But here's something that you might really find interesting. Did you know Texas is surrounded by open carry states? New Mexico and Louisiana have unlicensed concealed or unlicensed open carry, and they have licensed concealed carry. I was looking at my show notes, and I kind of got that reversed. My show notes said uh, licensed OC and unlicensed CC, but no, I fixed my show notes. New Mexico and Louisiana have licensed concealed carry and unlicensed OC, or open carry. Now, Oklahoma has licensed open carry and licensed concealed carry. But, let's say somebody from, I don't know, Vermont, where they have no license program, goes into Oklahoma. Oklahoma considers them to have a license simply because they have what's referred to as constitutional carry. And as I said before, you know, Arkansas is kind of a unique situation. Some folks say they have unlicensed carry. Some folks say they have only licensed concealed carry. You know, their situation, like I said, came about due to poorly written legislation 
And we will either need to see case law or their legislature go in and revise the law to make it a little more clear. Until then, just to say that, uh, just to say that Oklahoma has, or not Oklahoma, but to say that Arkansas has constitutional or open carry, I, I would be remiss if I actually said go over there and do it because you might get arrested. There's, a, there's some different interpretations of the law, and you really do run the risk of arrest in Arkansas if you go over there and try to carry there. But for the most part, it's recognized as being an open carry state. Now, you see, this is kind of a myth, but you see a lot of people, they come in and they say, well, Texas runs the risk of becoming a tourist trap, at least when people visit. And this claim comes about because we are surrounded by open carry states, and we have a reputation that causes people to assume open carry is legal here. And because of this, you tend to see people come into the Texas or come into Texas. They think open carry is legal. They and they do it, and then they get arrested. Uh, and here's the thing: I haven't seen any this happen. There may be a case or two. I have seen people because I live on the New Mexico state border or the state line with New Mexico, or not on it directly, but the county I live in is on the state line. And occasionally, we do see somebody come into the county open carrying. And, you know, it's usually just a gentle reminder, hey, if you got a license, conceal it. Otherwise, uh, you need to put it up because it's not legal to open carry here. I have yet to hear somebody being arrested for it. Now, another myth that we see in the open carry debate is open carry will cause more 30-06. Oh, man. It will cause more 30-06 signs to be hung. Now, it is possible that this will happen. However, if the law is written correctly, it is highly unlikely that it will. And the reason is, if the law is written so that it does not touch uh, Texas Penal Code Section 30.05 and Texas Penal Code Section 30.06, then you really get this uh, change in the law that basically says open carry is legal. If you want to prohibit open carry or even unlicensed carry, all you have to do is post up any gun buster sign and you're set. Or post up a sign that says guns are not allowed on this premises and you're set. As long as you leave uh, 30.06 and 30.05 alone, you'll be good. If anything, you might create a separate section of the law, and a couple of the bills that have been filed do this, I believe. Or or no, just one of the bills that's been filed does this. You you see a separate section 30.07, and the section 30.07 would apply to unlicensed, or I think in this case it would be open carry, licensed open carry. Now, as things currently sit, somebody wants to prohibit open carry of a long gun. All they have to do is post a sign that says firearms are not allowed in this building or rifles and shotguns are not allowed in this building or guns are not allowed in this building. And bam, everything that's not licensed is banned. Now, if somebody's carrying under the authority of a concealed handgun license, there's an exception in 30.5 that applies to them if the if the prohibition or If they're going to, basically, if you're going to charge somebody with trespass in Texas for carrying a gun into a privately posted location that's posted under 30.05, and the basis for that, for that prohibition is the fact that they're armed and they're armed because they have a concealed handgun license and they're carrying a concealed handgun, then 30.05 does not apply. 30.06 does. And 30.06 requires a very specific sign. 30.06 30.06 signage, that's pretty impressive. I mean, at least as far as size goes. So in all honesty, I really don't think open carry will cause more 30.06 signs to be posted as long as the bill that's eventually passed does not touch 30.06. Now you have, let's go in and let's talk a little bit about unlicensed or constitutional, as some people will refer to it, carry. I, I, I'll be honest, I don't like calling it un, I don't like calling it constitutional carry because, well, In all honesty, we don't depend on the Constitution to give us this right. We depend on the Constitution to protect that right. And in my opinion, by calling it constitutional carry, we are implying that this right is granted by the Constitution or that it is somehow bestowed upon us by the Constitution, and it's not. But instead, what we have is a right that predates the Constitution. It goes back to when man was first created or when man first evolved, if you believe in that camp. But you go back and you look at how the state or how 
you know, man has always had the right to defend themselves from something else. The Second Amendment exists, or the right that the Second Amendment protects exists before the Constitution. It existed before the Second Amendment. And when this country no longer exists, that right will still be a right that everybody has. It may be stripped from them by governments and laws and other things, but it's a right that they should still have. Now, criminals will always be able to illegally carry guns. However, you will, you will see a lot of debate whether or not unlicensed or constitutional carry will allow a criminal to legally carry a gun, and it won't. If they're not legal to possess it, then they're not legal to uh, carry it. Now, another argument you'll see against, uh, against unlicensed carry is that it might hurt reciprocity. Those, two, those who still maintain or get a license should still enjoy reciprocity. We're not talking about stripping away the CHL program in the name of unlicensed carry. No. All unlicensed carry would do is give the CHL program the ability to be an option. So let's say House Bill 195 uh, could be passed and signed into law by the wave of a magic wand, which oddly enough in my case is the shape of a pin that my bank gave out, or one of the banks in my town gave out, and I just waved the magic wand, HB 195 is the law of Texas, guess what? I'm still going to maintain my concealed handgun license, because when I go into New Mexico, I'm going to want that license so I can carry concealed. Okay, my magic wand doesn't work outside my room, apparently, because HB 195 is still listed as pre-filed. Oh, well, it was worth a try. Now, let's say somebody doesn't have a license, and let's say that for some reason they're being stalked or harassed or they're being, they got reason to fear for their life, and they think, I need to do something, I need to get protection, and they go, they get a gun, they get a little bit of training because they realize, hey, I need to know how to use this thing. I don't know, I don't know which end to, which end to hold and which end to point. Well, guess what? You got a single mother, or you got a woman whose husband has decided he's going to beat her, he's going to abuse her, and he's going to kill her, and they have gone their separate ways. He finds out where she lives, and he decides he's going to go over there, he's going to kill her. He doesn't need a license because he's already breaking the law. She should not have to have a license, but because we have a CHL program, well, you know what, he doesn't know where she's living right now. He knows where she shops. So he's going to go in, he's going to catch her when she's shopping, and he's going to shoot her dead. Well. Let's take our current situation. She's there. She's applied for a concealed handgun license. She's waiting for the background check to be completed and the license to be shipped to her so she can carry legally. And the bad, the bad husband or ex-husband shows up, takes his gun that he's carrying illegally because he, he can't get a license and he doesn't care about a license. He don't need a license. He takes that, he takes that gun he's carrying concealed illegally, points it at her, presses the trigger. Guess what? Licensing didn't help her. It did not save her. It did not keep that criminal from carrying. But let's say HB 195 was actually the law of the land thanks to my magic wand that looks like a pen. Well, he approaches her. He draws his gun. She sees that. She draws her gun. Even though she doesn't have a license, she's legal to have that gun now. And she shoots him, saving her life, possibly saving the lives of those around her. We don't know. We don't know if he decides he wants to go ahead and kill a bunch of people because he can. But we do know that she's alive, and maybe he's alive, maybe he's dead. We don't know. But he did not kill her. So we have a potentially abused woman that has saved her life, a life that she would have lost if she had to wait on a license. And for me, that right there is more than enough reason to pass unlicensed carry. In fact, let's refer to unlicensed carry as safe carry. Now then, you hear all this debate that Six or that you have six states that have unlicensed or constitutional carry in some form. And first off, you have Vermont. Vermont is strictly unlicensed carry. You do not have any kind of license that you can use for reciprocity. And then you have Alaska. Alaska came into the game after Vermont. Alaska maintains their concealed handgun license or their carry license for reciprocity reasons, but you don't have to have a license if you're in Alaska to carry. And the same thing for Arizona. Wyoming did it a little different. 
Wyoming said, well, if you are a resident of Wyoming, you can carry without a license. If you're not a resident, you got to have a license. And I don't know if that would pass uh, equal protection uh, in the Constitution. I mean, I really don't think that would pass muster under the Equal Protection Clause. But I could be wrong. I'm not a lawyer. And then you have Arkansas where you have you have people saying, yes, it is legal. And then you have uh, officials from the state of Arkansas saying, nah, no, it's not legal. Well, it's going to have to go to court or the legislature is going to have to step in and say, okay, here's the problem. Here's the bill. Let's make it uh, where it's less, where it's more clear. And then you have Oklahoma. And some people say, hey, wait a minute. You need a license to carry in Oklahoma. Only for residents of states that have a license requirement. If you have somebody that is allowed to carry in their state without a license, they can carry without a license in Oklahoma. Kind of neat. However, I really don't think that would pass uh, equal protection either. I think if somebody challenged it, it would basically, I think Oklahoma could easily become a unlicensed carry state if if somebody went in and said, hey, we got this uh, constitutional pr- concept called equal protection under the law. And it's not equal protection under the law for me as a non-resident to carry to have to have a license to carry when this guy that lives 10 miles the 10 miles across an imaginary line does not have to have a license to carry. And I can actually see that. But once again, I'm not a lawyer so. And you know, you and another myth is that Arkansas is a pure uncontested open carry and unlicensed carry state. You know, that's an odd situation. I've gone to it more than once. And let's just leave it at the fact that they're a gray area. And then we have the whole question of, well, you have states that restrict, you know, their open carry or their unlicensed carry to their residents. Can we do that in Texas? Well, the answer to that is yes, kind of, sort of, maybe, but not really. You see, we Texans tend to be a fair bunch. We like our laws to apply to everybody equally. We don't care about the color of the skin. We don't care about the uh, way somebody talks or what church they go to. And, you know, once again, we go back to that whole concept that you have this equal protection under the law. And now we have a new problem that's been mentioned. I've got a number of emails about it since it happened. We have open carry organizations showing that their members tend to disregard the law. And that unlicensed carry will make it easier for those like them to carry illegally or even commit crimes with less of a chance of somebody being able to stop them. This is like several different issues rolled up into one. In these groups, and you know, we'll, a lot of this is caused by the open carry Tarrant County member that you know went kind of um, on a murder spree and killed her estranged husband and stepdaughter. But groups like the, you know, these open carry groups that, you know, they have this history of getting arrested. They already carry. They're carrying long guns. They're carrying black powder replicas that there's no regulation on. And in all honesty, there's nothing to stop them now. And if someone with criminal intentions wants to carry a law that's on the books or not on the books, it's not going to stop them. But it will stop someone who is law abiding and may need that weapon in order to defend themselves. It will keep them from carrying. It will stop somebody that is concerned about being a good law-abiding citizen from being able to defend themselves, and the criminal still won't have the option, or the criminal won't care. The prohibition won't matter to them. I mean, think about it. Unlawful carry of a weapon, misdemeanor, I think it, I don't know, is it a Class B or a Class A? It could even be a ticket. It could be a Class C misdemeanor, for all I know. And I know it's a misdemeanor. We have unlawful carry of a weapon as a misdemeanor. Do you think a criminal that's going to go commit a felony really cares about being charged with a misdemeanor? No, they do not. They might be more concerned about getting charged with the felony, but they're not too concerned about a misdemeanor. They can beat that rap easy enough or ignore it. And then we come back to the whole 30-06 debate, which is really the same thing as uh, open carry, but with unlicensed carry, that unlicensed carry will lead to more 30-06 signs being put up. And as I stated before, 30-06 only applies to license holders carrying concealed handguns. As long as 30-06 and 30-05 are left alone, unlicensed carry should have no impact on signage prohibiting licensed concealed carry. You can't beat that. You can't beat that with a stick. But you know what? I've been on this topic for a while. I mean, we're 
After the news, we'll be pushing quite a bit of time, maybe even an hour or so. I'll probably cut out a few news articles while the contact audio is playing, and I'll be right back. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at GunRightsInTexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is GunRightsInTexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. And we're back for the news segment. Now the news segment. Oh man, I've actually cut out about five, maybe six. So I'm saying I cut about half or more of our news articles out in the interest of time. First off, criminal activity. We have two stories that I kept. Law enforcement authorities are looking for a suspect in the shooting death of a man outside of a movie theater on I-45 in one of Houston, Texas, northern suburbs. Basically, movie theaters, you know, they have this nasty habit of banning guns, especially after this uh, Dark Knight movie uh, shooting. And, well, because of it, people tend to see uh, movie theater patrons as easy victims. And I wouldn't be surprised if this guy was shot dead because the uh, shooter felt he could safely do it and not have to worry about repercussions there. And we have another story where a North Texas news station's meteorologist was shot multiple times by an as-of-yet unknown attacker. Now the victim is recovering in no small part because he thought fast and took actions that ultimately may have saved his life. Those actions were he started his car and he drove towards some construction workers where he got help from them. If he had stayed in his car, he probably would have been killed, or he would have bled out and died. But he thought quickly, he got help, and he survived. He's in the hospital recovering. Great news. Even when you're not armed, you can still be armed. And in all honesty, if you you are a, if you are ever attacked, you really need to concentrate on surviving. If that means you have to fight your way through the attacker, then you fight your way through the attacker. If that means fleeing, then you flee. If it means a combination of the two, then you do a combination of the two. There is no requirement that you have to be a hero and die in a blaze of glory. Now then, in the politics category, we have cut it back to one. And I love this article because it's just a headline. That's all that's really there. And the headline is, the biggest threat to Texas open carry legislation could be supporters of the measure. Now, this is on the High Plains Public Radio blog, and it leaves us with hype and no facts. To clarify, uh, what? let me just say that in order to mention this in all honesty, the article does not go into any detail. It just links to an uh, article from somewhere else. However, in the last three sessions of the state legislature, History has shown us that supporters of open carry tend to, they tend to get the bills hurt. They tend to attack their own. In 2009, Debbie Riddle was approached. She asked the legislative council to draft a bill. That bill was drafted. She was attacked because she didn't file it for them. And she agreed to get one drafted. She did not agree to file it. And she wasn't going to file it. She went ahead. She got it drafted. She felt, well, if I get the bill drafted, we can turn around and give it to you. You can go approach somebody and get it introduced. You know what? They attacked her for it. And then you had, in 2011, Representative George Lavender. He got a bill filed. It made it through committee, and it died in the calendars committee. Everybody was happy, but they were mad at the calendars committee for killing the bill. And a lot of that came about because the advocates for the, that were pushing the bill were calling the members of the calendar committee harassing them. So in 2013, George Lavender refiled the bill. There were some objections to the bill, and it was rumored that there would be a committee substitute to some of the language in the bill that would have cleaned it up and got it where it would have been more likely to pass. And guess what happened? Supporters of the bill kept calling, uh, they kept calling the, uh, representatives office that were the representatives that were on the committee and basically the bill died in committee because the supporters of the bill were harassing the, uh, the representatives that were on that committee. They were telling them what the constitution said, how to do their job. And I'll be honest, 
you show up, you start telling me this is what you need to do. This is how you're supposed to do it. You're probably not going to get my help. If you call and say, hey, I would appreciate it if you do this, you have a better chance of me doing it than calling me up saying, you better do this or we will find somebody to replace you. Uh, Yeah, the asking nicely is going to get more results than threatening. I'm just saying. And that's really how, you know, this is really what we've seen in the history. And the last article I want to touch on, I've, I've really, it's not really a Texas related article, but it is. And this is in the miscellaneous. And it's not really something that's gun rights related, but we're going to talk about it because it involves a big gun. It involves people getting threats and it involves ISIS. Yes, ISIS. You see, a Texas City plumbing company, Mark One Plumbing, has been flooded with calls, many of which were threatening because an F-250 pickup they turned in as a trade-in. Now, this F-250 somehow found its way to Syria and insurgent, or not insurgents, but uh, ISIS posted a picture of them driving this pickup with a gun in the back, a mounted gun. This would be an anti-aircraft gun. And they're firing this mounted anti-aircraft gun in the back of this F-250. And they're really proud of this. And they posted this to the internet. And somehow, Mark One Plumbing did not remove their decals off the doors. And everybody that owned it after them did not remove Mark One Plumbing's information off the doors. I said decals, but it may have been painted. But for some reason, Mark One Plumbing, with a phone number, is still on the door of that pickup, if it still exists. It's in a war zone, so it may not exist anymore. Now, for the record, this is what's called a technical. A technical is a non-combat vehicle modified by mounting a weapon on that vehicle so that it can be used in combat. And as I said, in this case, this particular technical features an anti-aircraft gun. Now, we're not going to have a legislative update in this one either. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to save that until after Christmas. So basically, I'm going to go ahead and thank everybody for listening. I want to thank uh, Charles Cotton, uh, Alice Tripp, Tara Micah, anybody else that's involved in our legislative process that's actually trying to further gun rights. I want to thank all of them for their efforts. And I want to thank you listeners for listening. And for everybody that's going to get involved when the TSRA says, hey, we need, to, we need you to start calling and putting pressure on these people. And then when they say, hey, we need you to stop calling and putting pressure on these people. Those of you who listen, I want to thank you as well. With that said, stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.